Hello and welcome to Skype Academy Presents Skype Room Systems version 2. Before we get into today's content, I wanted to spend a moment to introduce myself. My name is Nick Smith. I've been with Microsoft for nine years. I'm a principal program manager. I am part of the Skype for Business product group, very specifically the Customer Experience and Deployment Academy team, where our goal is to enhance the customer and partner experience by capturing feedback to influence product direction while enabling organizations of any size to get to our cloud service by providing best-in-class readiness and deployment services. Our agenda today, we're going to spend a few moments talking about why Skype Room Systems. Then we're going to get into the technical bits of what you need to know when you're planning for these systems, what you need to do in the process of deployment, and the tools that you have available for operations. In scope, everything related to Skype Room Systems version 2. Uh, I'll also get a little bit into the differences of when you would want to use a Skype Room System versus a Surface Hub. However, that's the deepest I'm going to go on anything outside Skype Room Systems. Uh, I will not be covering version 1 of Skype Room Systems. I won't be covering Surface Hub in depth. And I won't be covering other conference room scenarios. I will also not be covering Skype Room Systems adoption content. There's other content that's out there and available that will walk you through all the different user experiences with Skype Room Systems. This session is meant to provide a primer for how to um, plan and deploy Skype Room Systems within an organization. So first, the positioning. Why Skype Room Systems? According to recent studies, 97.5% of all conference rooms have projectors and displays and audio speaker phones. However, these two things are disconnected. People dial in to listen to the audio of the conference, but they're not able to see what's projected, what's being shared in the meeting. They're not a first class meeting attendee because their video isn't displayed for those in the room to see them. And they also don't get to understand or see who's talking in the room. And it leads to confusion and it leads to a disconnected experience. Of those remaining 2.5% of meeting rooms that are equipped for video, studies show that they're only used about two hours per week. Why is that? The problem of joining a meeting often is that it's too complex, that it takes too long to find out what the coordinates are, get video up, get content displayed, get audio going. And so people are intimidated by it. And these meeting rooms don't get used to their fullest potential. This is the opportunity that we see that we can address with Skype Room Systems V2. Skype Room Systems V2 is an appliance that you can build or you can purchase through one of our um, device partners that is meant to transform that existing meeting room that has a projector or a monitor and transform it into a Skype for Business meeting room. It comes with the Skype for Business feature set. It comes with all of the capabilities that you get with Skype for Business, with scheduling through Outlook, one-click join, um, the ability of dialing in um, other participants via the PSTN. Um, it also allows you to have a device in the room that is the center of control. We found that as people are driving these rooms, they always want to be within arm's reach of being able to control what the experience in the room is, whether that's joining the meeting, adding someone else to the meeting, changing the layout of what's being shown on the screen, sharing any content. This is a one, um, one device designed to support all of those scenarios. What's different about Skype Room Systems V2 is that it's designed to integrate with your existing investments. You can also scale to any size of the room. This isn't a solution that you go and buy that requires you to replace all of the existing equipment into the room. This is designed to reuse that, that monitor or projector that's already in the room and enhance that overall meeting room experience to bring remote participants in. 
It's also built on a Windows 10 device, which means that your IT department already has the tools that will allow you to manage the device, to make sure that it's up to date, to make sure that it's secure. And it's not a, another appliance that's out there that you have to buy additional management tools. So we do have a number of partners who are uh, developing offerings around Skype or Skype Room Systems V2. Um, I will not go into depth on what their offering entails. I just want to call out the partners that are available and building solutions with this. I encourage you to go to their website to find out the details and the exact costing of each of these devices. First is the Logitech Smart Dock. Um, you can see it pictured on the left-hand side of your screen. That dock is going to be shipping in Q4 of calendar year 16. Our next partner building devices is Crestron. Crestron's been a great partner of Microsoft over the years and has had a, a large um, investment in Skype room systems. And you can see their vision on what this device would look like in their dock um, that will be shipping in the first half of calendar year 17. And then finally, we also have Polycom. Uh, you can see their vision on their dock uh, on the left-hand side. Um, they also offer turnkey meeting room solutions if you are building uh, new rooms that you want to fully integrate the experience. The important part to remember here is that the experience that you get, the piece of managing the software, the, the actual interface with Skype Room Systems V2, is the same on all of these. Each vendor will have unique offerings in terms of what the audio or video device is, or maybe some of the capabilities of the dock. But the overall experience that you have with uh, interfacing with joining the meeting experience and driving the meeting experience will be the same. So that's kind of what Skype Room System is. Now let's talk about what you need to do to plan before choosing Skype Room Systems and deploying it. The first thing is know your room. So every customer is going to have different rooms for different purposes. There could be smaller rooms for one-to-one uh, -one video conferencing, maybe smaller team huddles. There's the typical meeting room scenario, board rooms, um, and it's important to understand what the purpose of that room is. The reason is, is that if your purpose is to go and do collaboration, which means I'm gonna be building stuff and I'm gonna be drawing on the screen and I want to use big whiteboard scenario, then you might want to look at something like the Surface Hub. If the room purpose is to enable meetings and have remote participants, that's when you're really gonna be looking for Skype Room Systems. The next thing is, what is the room size? The room size is gonna to dictate to you um, what devices you are going to need to go along with this. Based upon the room size, you'll have different microphone options with maybe satellite mics, um, maybe a wider angle uh, camera to make sure that you can uh, get everyone in the room for that collaboration. Is there any existing equipment? Will I be reusing the projector um, in the room? Will I be reusing uh, a phone device that's in the room? What's that going to mean for the user experience? And then also, what other modalities are needed, right? Everyone has a different set of Skype for Business features deployed. Um, the nice thing about Skype room systems is that it will take advantage of all those different options. So if you have an online deployment that uh, has PSTN calling enabled, you can use Skype Room Systems to call out to PSTN connect through PSTN connectivity. If you have an on-prem deployment in which you have PSTN deployed, you can do the same. Um, it will allow you to utilize the features that are available within your environment. If you are not looking for it to be the center of control for dialing into the conference, you can also keep an existing IP phone from another provider there. That may not provide the best experience, but at least you're still getting overcoming the initial joining the meeting experience with Skype Room Systems. So a quick comparison between Surface Hub and Skype Room Systems. As I said, you wanna know the purpose of the room. 
If the purpose of the room is to go up and draw on the whiteboard or use touch on the device, you're really going to be looking at something like Surface Hub. What I've done here is I've highlighted three important distinctions that will help um, make the decision between is Surface Hub right for the room or Skype Room Systems V2. Um, I've talked about collaboration. Um, if you want touch on the device, you want to have one note, you want to be able to draw on a whiteboard, that's where you're going to want Surface Hub. Uh, Skype Room Systems is, is designed right now for a projection or a monitor that is not necessarily touch enabled. Um, the other thing is also where you want to have control of the device. Um, Surface Hub is really built for that collaboration, which means that whoever is driving the device is up at the device. And they're able to touch the screen, select the things that they want to do. Whereas Skype Room Systems V2 is meant to be at the center of the table where someone is sitting down and driving the meeting. When I talked about understanding the size of the room, um, that was mainly around determining what kinds of devices you need. What I'm sharing right now is a draft of some of the certified Skype Room Systems peripherals. I say it's draft because we haven't um, uh, finalized this, we haven't published it yet. Um, it's also not complete. We are going to be certifying products from um, our three Skype Room System uh, vendors, um, Logitech, Crestron, and Polycom. But we will also have certified devices from device vendors like Jabra and Sennheiser. What I'm sharing right now are some of those devices that you might use in a smaller room. You can get away with that, that webcam that will make sure that you can get two to three people in, in, in the picture and a, um, a, a small kind of personal speakerphone that performs really, really well in these small room scenarios. However, when you go to a bigger room and a bigger space and you want to make sure that you incorporate everyone into the conference, that's where you're going to be looking at some of these larger sets of, um, of peripherals to bring into the Skype room system. Again, the Skype room system is designed to fit rooms of all sizes and, and, and all modalities. So these things will allow you to um, deliver the experience that you want in the room and for your remote participants based upon the requirements of that room and size. So supported topologies. Um, where can you deploy Skype room systems? Um, first of all, we support the Office 365 scenario in which you have Skype for Business Online with Exchange Online. Um, that's going to be a, a typical scenario for customers who are in Greenfield um, or have um, starting their conferencing deployment. We do recognize that many people who have been using Skype for Business in the past for conferencing are going to have an on-premise pre uh, presence, whether it's fully on-premise or whether it's hybrid. In the scenario in which the user is hosted on-premise, we support the topologies in which we have Exchange hosted online in Office 365, or that Exchange is on-premise that is running at least Exchange 2003 SP1. Um, I say at least because that means any updates post SP1, but also Exchange 2016 is supported. What does that mean? That we do not, Skype Room Systems V2 does not support anything prior to Exchange to, uh, 2003 SP1. It also does not support Link Server 2013. I want to call that out because Skype Room Systems V1 and Surface Hub do support Link Server 2013. So again, when you're looking at, is this the right solution for you? understand the way that you're currently deployed and how it fits into uh, your deployment. Networking requirements. Um, we do require DHCP. Um, this is because the out-of-box experience, when you open up the app, it's going to go and it's going to ask you for the information to log in. Um, but there is no way to configure the IP address from within the app. So this is where we're saying DHCP is required. Uh, you can absolutely sign in as administrator, go into the Windows settings, configure Windows settings as you would. But for the out-of-box experience, we're saying DHCP is required. 
We're also seeing a wired network connection. And as I get into bandwidth requirements, you'll you'll see at the maximum amount how much bandwidth we might be pushing through here. And in order to get the best quality, and in order to get the best experience for those in the room and those that are remote, we are requiring a wired network connection. And we actually recommend a gigabit connection to make sure that we have the available bandwidth. Uh, we do support proxy servers if they're deployed online. And there's a way of configuring that through the Windows interface, logging in as the administrator um, uh, after the initial setup. In terms of firewall requirements and, and um, requirements of what this device needs to talk to, think of this as the same as any other Skype for Business client. So the same ports and protocols that need to be opened to Office 365 or to federated partners or to your internal deployment need to be opened. Those things are documented out on TechNet. Um, I would assume anyone who is deploying Skype Room systems has deployed clients is aware of where that uh, information is. On top of that, there is some kind of phone home capability that allows us, if you opt in, to collect data to improve experience. These um, locations are different than the client. So the two URLs that you see on the slide will allow the client to send anonymous data to improve experience. So something to be aware of when you're deploying this, if you see these URLs coming up, it's so that it can send back data and improve experiences. Bandwidth requirements. Um, what I want to talk about is at the maximum amount of bandwidth used is what we should be planning for bandwidth requirements. I want to call out very specifically, this is maximum. This is not typical. This is not um, what you can expect most of the time, but this is at its peak amount, how much could you use? Because we want to plan for that scenario to make sure that if that scenario ends up happening, that we're still going to have a good experience. So that means that from a download perspective, the maximum amount of bandwidth that we're going to push this thing through is when we have four other participants join to the meeting, each sending us a 720p video stream. In that case, the total amount of bandwidth for those video streams is going to be 10 megabits per second download. Now, video resolutions and the amount of bandwidth um, can change based upon who's connecting to you, the quality of their webcam, what network conditions are. So it could certainly be a lot less than that 10 megabits per second. Um, I also want to call out that on top of that, you will be receiving an audio stream of G722 audio that will be an additional 160 kilobits per second. When you compare that to the 10 megabits of video, it's inconsequential. And so that's why I just want to make sure that we call that out. From an upload perspective, there's the potential that depending upon who is connecting to this conference and who is watching the video feed from the room, that we might have to send up to four video streams of the same video to make sure that we're able to meet the resolution requirements of those devices. So if someone is on the other end, maybe in another Skype room system or on a client with the window maximized, we might be sending them a 1080p video stream at four megabits per second. Someone else may only be able to receive 720. And then you could actually have someone who is watching the video stream on their phone, which means we might have to send down to a 240p um, video stream. What this means is that at, at absolute worst, we would have to send these four video streams. When you add up the amount of bandwidth of what it would mean to send all of these at their maximum uh, rate, it would be seven and a half megabits per second. You could also be doing some video-based content sharing. And this could be if something was plugged into the screen. Um, if, that is, if that is being used, then that could also be sending up to a 1080p video stream at four megabits per second. I also want to call out that audio will be sent from this device, again, planning for G722 of up to 160 kilobits per second. 
Again, these are worst case scenarios that are used for planning to make sure you have the available bandwidth um, if any of these scenarios happen. It is not typical, it is not the sustained amount, um, but this is what should be used for planning. I do want to call out that the amount of bandwidth needed is very dependent on what the meeting room scenario is. Um, and so this is kind of a worst case scenario in terms of bandwidth on how the room is being used and how um, uh, the, the types of video streams that they are having. So if, if the Skype room system is participating with someone else on video, then it'll be sending a up to a four megabit stream of a 1080p video stream. When you add in a third person so that you're seeing two video streams on the, um, um, on the Skype room system, uh, you can have up to two 1080p streams. Now, this isn't linear. When you add in another person with video, there's not enough screen real estate to be able to show all those 1080p video streams. So at that point, you're going to have the spleen script, uh, split. You could have one video stream at 1080p and the other two at 720p. But the bandwidth continues to grow. The maximum amount that you're going to get, as I talked about on the previous slide, is where you have a 720p video stream in each quadrant of the screen. And that adds up to 10 megabits per second. If there's any content being shared in the meeting, whether it's an uploaded uh, PowerPoint presentation, whether it's a desktop share, um, but any content is being shared there, what's going to happen is that those uh, up to four video streams are going to be docked to the side. The resolution is going to get smaller because um, we're not showing them at their full fidelity, which is going to drop that video stream to uh, 240p at a lower amount of bandwidth. And then we will show that shared content um, in, in the case of uh, video-based screen sharing. It could be up to a 1080p stream at 4 megabits per second. This means that in that scenario in which you're doing collaboration and sharing, you're probably going to be maxing out at um, almost 5.5 megabits per second. Again, in all of these scenarios, um, the video stream might actually be less depending upon who's connecting to you and what the network conditions are. So just important to call out that these are the maximums. Uh, and I also want to call out again, um, you will always want to plan for that G722 audio, which will be an additional 160 kilobits per second. Uh, there's only one audio stream in all of these scenarios. That completes the planning process for Skype Room Systems. Next, I'd like to talk a little bit about the deployment process. There's a checklist that you want to go through in the deployment, and I'm going to cover each of these checklist items in depth in the coming slides. But first and foremost, before you deploy your very first Skype Room System, you're going to want to prepare Active Directory policies for these room systems. Then, per, per each Skype Room System that you have, you're going to go through a process of provisioning and configuring an account for the system to use, deploy the device and peripherals, configure it, and then also ensure that the peripherals are set up in the desired manner. Um, this does require a number of different roles. You're going to want to make sure you have someone from Active Directory to make sure all the policies are configured, um, Exchange and Skype for Business service owners to make sure the device has an account that it can log into that is configured in the appropriate ways. And then also, don't forget the audio video equipment installers who should be the ones who go and deploy this within the room, connect it up to the monitors, hide all the cables, make sure that everything has a nice and clean uh, appearance for the users as they uh, walk into the room and start to use these devices. So first of all, preparing Active Directory. I want to call out uh, at the beginning that joining a Skype room system device to Active Directory is optional. But we do expect many people to be doing this um, so that they get the advantages of IT managed policies to make sure that the device is up to date, that it's secure, that it has antivirus on it. We do not recommend using a domain account for auto logon though. The device comes with an account already configured, already locked down for kind of a kiosk mode um, that is meant for running 
the Skype Room System application. Um, as I mentioned before, these device machine accounts should be moved to a dedicated organizational unit. The reason why we want to do that is that we want to avoid having particular GPO policies applied to these devices. We want to have the device on and ready and have the Skype Room System app running when users walk into the room and want to join a meeting. This means that we need to avoid policies like requiring screensavers. The device uses an auto logon into a local account, so we want to make sure that we avoid policies that require that you hit control alt delete to sign in. These are policies that we want to make sure are applied to the Skype Room System devices, but maybe not all other devices that are domain joined. And that's why we want to have everything in a dedicated organizational unit. Another group policy item that you want to consider is to ensure that you've updated the client QoS policies to add the Microsoft that Skype Room Systems.exe application to the ability to tag packets with the appropriate QoS markings. Um, if you have Skype for Business deployed within the organization and you're using client side markings, chances are you've already set this up within your infrastructure, but it's looking for link.exe in order to do that tagging. By adding this application name, we make sure that we get the same quality of experience um, scenario that you're going to have with the rest of your machines um, in the deployment. We also recommend that you specify an administrator group. In order to log out of the Skype for Business uh, account that is in kiosk mode and do any configurations on the device, whether it's configuring uh, the peripherals, updating firmwares, um, you're going to need to log into that machine as an administrator. So you'll probably want to specify a group of the group within the organization that manages these devices to be administrators of all of the Skype room systems so that they can go through and do the tasks that they need to do to make sure everything's configured and up to date. Um, we also recommend that you set a local administrator password. Every device comes with the same local administrator password that is quite simplistic. And so we recommend ensuring that that is changed through policies. We also want to make sure that we're not applying any custom power policies, either through group policy or tools like System Center Configuration Manager. The device comes with a power policy that has already been configured to make sure that we're going to be able to get the most out of the machine when driving multiple HD videos presented onto the screen and when sending HD video. So it's important that we don't try and limit its processing. In coordination with the dock provided by our partners, it also has the ability of already turning off the screen, but waking up when the dock notifies the device that someone is in the room. That brings the device back on. It makes sure that as someone approaches the device, the Skype Room System app is available and that they can join the meeting. So it's important that we don't change any of those custom power policies. Then we also want to make sure that any policies applied to this device will automatically install and reboot the uh, install updates and reboot the machine after hours. The last thing that we want to have happen um, for a machine that is always on is for that reboot to happen during the middle of someone's meeting. So make sure that the device has a policy that will allow it to get updates reboot even though it's already logged on uh, after hours. Next, for each device we need to go through and provision and configure an account for that device to use. This needs to be unique per device because you're going to have that device in a meeting room. You will be scheduling that meeting room and so we want those calendar items to show up in that meeting room. If you try to share the same account across multiple devices, then you're going to see multiple meetings that may not be intended for that room or device. We also have to have a known password. So if your room already has an Exchange room mailbox set up, it may not have a password. Um, but we need to make sure that we have that password so that the device can log in to that Skype for Business account that Exchange account, download the meetings, uh, log into the meeting, and, and be able to um, present and share everything from um, the console. In order to do that, we have to know the password. 
And so we have to be able to assign that. Um, we also need to make sure that we have the appropriate licensing assigned. Uh, this is very important for Office 365, where if you don't have the licenses assigned, you can't do the configurations. But we also want to make sure that we have all the appropriate licenses set up and assigned um, to the device to meet licensing requirements. Um, then after all that is done, we need to make sure and that we configure Exchange and Skype for Business appropriately so that the device can be used in its intended purpose. I don't have those exact configuration steps on screen here because I don't think everyone wants to consult this presentation for the PowerShell steps that need to be run. All of these steps are documented in the deployment guide. There will also be device provisioning scripts that will be published in which you can run that will automatically go through, assign the licenses, configure Exchange, and Skype for Business. I encourage that, uh, using those uh, when deploying Skype Room systems. But essentially the process is with Exchange, you take that account, um, if you're creating a new account, or if you have an old account, make sure that it's a, a room mailbox. Once it's uh, defined as a room mailbox, we can enable some calendar processing. That calendar processing will allow it to automatically accept meetings that have been scheduled, as long as they're not conflicting with other meetings. The reason why we want to do this is because we want to have the meeting accepted and on the calendar for that room so that the Skype room system device will see that meeting on the calendar and can present it for whoever is walking into the room at that time with the join option. From a Skype perspective, we want to enable it as a CS meeting room. And then optionally, depending upon how you are intending to use the device, you'll want to assign a phone number and enable it for PSTN connectivity if it will be making outbound PSTN phone calls. So what licensing does that require? Um, this is just a, a quick kind of copy and paste from the frequently asked questions document that is going to ship with the devices. This gives you a, a very quick rundown on the licensing required based upon how you're going to use the device. Um, these are also uh, stated as the licensing minimums. So if you had E3 licenses, you could assign those instead of E1. Um, but I just wanted to call this out, make sure that you are aware there's documents detailing what, licensings, what licenses are required. The amount of licensing per device really depends on how you're going to use the device. If it is just going to join scheduled meetings, then it requires a lesser amount of licensing than if it was also going to be initiating meetings, or if you're planning on um, dialing out from this device to the PSTN. So make sure you review this, understand how you are going to be using the device, and then make sure that you have the appropriate licenses assigned. So now we're going to get into the deployment process of Skype Room Systems. I think the easiest way to do this is to go through and talk about the components that make up a Skype Room System. So first, you're going to have the existing room screen. Or this could be a screen that has been purchased and is being deployed as you set up a new room, but this is a different peripheral. Then what you have is a Surface Pro 4 that is actually encapsulated in the partner Skype Room System dock. Um, every Skype Room System is built upon this Surface Pro 4. There are certain minimum requirements. The application has been designed with these drivers and this device in mind. It will always have a Surface Pro 4. The partner Skype Room Systems dock is the piece that enables this Surface Pro 4 to connect to all the peripherals and has all the kind of port replicators. It also has devices in it that will allow an HDMI input to be connected to the Surface Pro 4. Um, you will use that HDMI input to do any screen sharing within the room to be able to share whatever is, ever, whatever is connected to that HDMI input into the meeting. And so that dock is really the critical component that turns the Service Pro 4 with the application into the meeting room device that has all of the abilities of connecting with these peripherals and bringing in input. You'll also have the camera. Um, we talked about what some of those devices were before. 
and then the speaker and microphone. Um, what is shown here is probably for the smaller room scenario, but you will definitely select the speaker microphone camera peripherals based upon the room size, layout, and uh, intended room purpose. So what are your options for getting a Skype room system? First, you can purchase a bundle via device partner. If you do this, then you will get the dock, the Surface Pro 4 that is already loaded um, with Skype Room Systems app, um, your video equipment, your audio equipment. And uh, this is kind of the easiest turnkey way of putting it, uh, of deploying a Skype Room System. However, if you do have requirements that you need to uh, use your own corporate approved image, you can do, kind of uh, do it yourself, which means bring your own Surface Pro 4 or even update the Surface Pro 4 that comes in a partner bundle. But um, acquire your own Surface Pro 4, make sure you have the partner dock, make sure you have the appropriate devices, and then you can go through a process of imaging that Surface Pro 4 with Windows 10 Enterprise. The configuration files that will lock down the auto logon experience for that kind of kiosk account. Also, an initial um, application project that will install the Skype Room Systems app after first run. And this process, which is documented in the deployment guide, will um, set up the Surface Pro 4 to be ready for the first run experience and be have the same configurations and experience that you would get if you bought the Surface Pro 4 through the partner device bundle. Um, I do want to call out if you're going to do it yourself, you do need to make sure that you have a full Windows 10 Enterprise license uh, assigned to that Surface Pro 4 um, uh, when you are doing the imaging process. Okay, so now you have your, your Active Directory configured, your account configured, the device deployed, you boot it up, what's the first run experience? So every Skype Room Systems device by default will have two accounts. The first is a Skype login, which is a local account that is configured for auto login to the device. Every time the device reboots, it's going to log in as this Skype account. It has very, very restricted capabilities it's meant to run in a kiosk mode. And it is also set to auto launch the Skype Room Systems application. Also, should that application be closed in any way, um, it will relaunch that, that application so that we always make sure that that is, being, uh, is what is presented to the user as they enter the room. In addition to that Skype account, there will be a local administrator account called admin with the initial password of S for B. This is going to be used for accessing any Windows settings. When the device first comes out of the box, you're gonna to want to do certain administrative tasks like set the time, maybe join it to a domain. You'll have to log in with that local admin account and password. We recommend that you change that password immediately, if, uh, whether it's through the device itself setting it locally or whether it's through a domain join process that defines the local administrator password. Um, we recommend that you don't leave it out there with the initial password of S for B. Once the device boots up and you uh, um, automatically get logged into the Skype account, on first run of the Skype room systems application, you're going to be prompted with this uh, setup screen. The very first screen on that is going to be accepting the end user license agreement. Then you will provide it with the sign in address, username and password of the account. This is the account that we set up on a per Skype room system um, basis and is already configured with the room mailbox and the calendar processing. This will log you in to uh, both Exchange and Skype for Business and bring you to uh, the meeting experience. After that, you have an option of configuring some of the device defaults um, for things like automatically sharing content if something is plugged into HDMI, and then an opportunity to finish the application launch. 
once you've gone through this initial application launch, you are going to be put into the Skype room system kiosk mode, and it's going to be up and running. The actual uh, process of signing in this device is very simple in terms of the overall deployment process. Once you have the device that has been deployed, you've initially signed in, um, you're going to want to go through and do some configuration steps. This is when you are going to go into the settings and tell it to go into Windows settings and then log in as the uh, local administrator that I've talked about before. Some of these configuration steps that you're going to want to do after first run is optionally join it to a domain. Reminder, if you're joining it to the domain, make sure it gets put into the proper OU that is going to get the Skype Room Systems policies. You'll probably want to rename the computer to be something that is familiar for you so that you understand where that computer is or uh, your asset tagging within um, uh, your enterprise to understand where this device is deployed. And then as I, I can't stress enough, change the local admin, admin password. After that, we're also gonna wanna make sure that we have the latest security updates and that we have the latest firmwares. So apply any updates that uh, are available to the device. This could be Windows updates, it could be the Skype Room Systems uh, application auto-updating via the store, or it could be uh, looking for firmware updates for any of the audio video devices that are connected to these devices. Optionally, if you're connecting to an on-premise Skype for Business or Exchange environment, you will also want to install um, any certificate routes for any local CAs that you might have. Um, this is actually the number one support item of people get these devices, they can't log in, and they don't know why. It's just a reminder that if you have anything that's um, signing certificates internally, that we trust that issuer. So install any root certificate um, authorities onto this device. After we've gone through the update process, we're going to want to make sure that we configure audio and video to uh, work for the room. So make sure that the camera is functional and positioned correctly, that you're getting the field of vision that you want to see. Um, from an audio perspective, make sure that the that sound is coming out of the appropriate um, speakers, um, that it's not coming out of the TV or something else. That the microphones are picking up, um, are positioned well and are picking up everyone in the room. And that you're using the microphones from your device and maybe not the webcam. We want to make sure that everyone gets a quality experience, which means making sure we're using the devices that we want. For the devices that we don't want to use, um, we recommend that you go into Device Manager and disable those devices. That way, if a device happens to get unplugged and then plugged back in, we don't have to go through the reconfiguration process. We'll always go back to the device that we already had. Um, I also want to call out that uh, I talked about the Surface Dock and it included an HDMI input device. When you go through and you configure the uh, initial settings for which devices you want to use, you want to make sure that that HDMI input device is set as the default recording device. We want to do this because if you happen to play anything through that HDMI connection that has audio, we want to capture that audio channel so that we can pipe it into the meeting. And so in order to do that, it has to be set as the default recording device. Now, sometimes devices that we have disabled through device manager because we don't want to use can get re-enabled on reboot or on driver updates. And so if you really want to make sure that these devices are never used, you can also use a GPO or a local security policy to prevent re-enabling this device. It's kind of an extra step to make sure you are always in the intended configuration. And that's the process of deploying Skype Room systems. Once they're deployed, we will also want to look at what the process for operating these Skype Room systems is. Now this is a Windows 10 device, so it can be managed in the same way in which IT manages all other Windows 10 devices. It can have um, antivirus uh, deployed to it. It can get updates through your local update servers. Uh, it can have um, different policies applied to the device. 
the intent of Skype Room Systems built on this architecture is to have IT manage it in the same way. I do want to cover some very specific um, thoughts that you'll want to have for troubleshooting, for managing the app, as well as um, how you can keep a current view on the device and operations. Though. The first thing is, how are you going to manage the updates to the Skype Room Systems application? Um, so first of all, I want to call out the Skype Room Systems application is a Windows Store app, but it is marked as private. It's not discoverable. You can't go and search for it in the Windows Store. But because this application becomes comes pre-installed in the Partner Bundle or via the device imaging process if you're using your own Surface Pro 4, it will have the link to the application in the Windows Store. So if you do nothing else, this device will get updates when we publish them to the Windows Store and we'll apply them in the background. Now, if you want to have more control over when these devices get updated for this app to make sure that you know, all of your Skype Room systems are running the same version or that you have an opportunity to try any updates before they're deployed out to your organization, you can control how these updates are deployed to the device in the same way that you control other Windows Store application updates to other devices. So you can use System Center uh, Configuration Manager or Company Portal to um, determine when these updates are pushed out to the device. We support that with Skype Room Systems V2. Now, if you do have any issues signing in to the device, uh, we do have some recommend recommendations for troubleshooting. Um, we find it easier to troubleshoot sign-in issues on another device rather than trying to get the logs off this device, open them up, and analyze them. So if you have any sign-in troubleshooting issues, we recommend that on another computer you download and uh, use the Link Connectivity Analyzer. This will allow you to specify the username and password as you do on the Skype Room system and see if you're able to connect. This is great for validating that you know the password, that you know the sign-in address, that you're able to make the appropriate connections either uh, through firewalls or through DNS in order to look up and connect to the servers to log, into the, um, log in with those credentials. If it fails through Link Connectivity Analyzer, you are going to want to find out why it failed and you're gonna look into the infrastructure uh, or the account provisioning process to find out why it failed. If it works through the link connectivity analyzer but still continues to not work on the Skype Room Systems device, then I would go through and I would check certificates. As we said, this is the top support call driver for Link Room Systems. And so make sure that you have the appropriate certificate trust on the machine so that it can connect um, to, to your local exchange and Skype for Business uh, deployments. Now, from an ongoing operations perspective, we expect that these things are going to be maintained, uh, be updated through normal processes, and that the application will be always be front and center and operating. However, there may be times in which you need to query information from this device so that you can understand how it's performing or what it's connected to or how things are configured. Uh, we will be shipping an additional um, guide that gives instructions on how you can query some of these things. But I wanted to call out some very specific examples of information that you can gather if you enable Remote PowerShell on this device. Um, through Remote PowerShell, you can go through and query the application status that will give you a real-time view on what the application version is and whether or not it is up on the screen and running. This is great if someone calls in and says, hey, I'm in such and such a room and the device doesn't look like the way I expect. You can go through, run this command and see if the application is up and running or if it's at the latest version. You can also go through and you can query what the connected devices are. So if someone calls up and says, I'm in this room and I can't see video or people can't hear me, um, remotely you can connect to it, query and see 
if all the devices are connected or if something has become disconnected that will then allow you to go and issue a trouble ticket, have someone go and connect those devices. You can also query systems information that will allow you to see how the system is performing, if there are any event logs or uh, any errors on the system that need to be investigated. And finally, many times um, the process of kind of resetting the experience on the device so that people come into a familiar experience would be rebooting the device. Remember, the device has an auto logon account that auto launches the Skype Room Systems application. The process of rebooting or resetting the device will cause it to then go through, log in as that account and bring up the familiar interface. And so um, remotely rebooting the device is an easy way of making sure that it, it is at an expected configuration. If, however, you are continuing to have issues that require some sort of logs for further uh, investigation, we do have a script that is located on every Skype Room system device under the path that is noted on the slide. Log in as administrator onto that machine, run that script, it will go out, it will collect a whole number of different uh, logs that are needed for troubleshooting, and I'll put it into a zip file. Take that zip file and then send it off to whoever is helping you with troubleshooting, and that will include all of the logs that are uh, related to the Skype Room Systems application. So that's what we have uh, for initial Skype Room Systems V2 um, planning, deployment, and operations. Um, some of the key learnings that I want everyone to walk away from today's sessions are. Um, Skype Room Systems V2 has been designed to enable your existing conference rooms, your existing investments in those conference rooms, to bring the full fidelity audio, video, content sharing experience to those rooms, and to make it easier to use those rooms through a simple to use application that allows people to one click join the rooms, bring up all the devices. It also adapts to any size meeting room based upon the range of devices that can be um, plugged into the Skype Room Systems dock as peripherals. We did go through deployment requirements. I want everyone to um, uh, be familiar with the infrastructure requirements, the potential amount of bandwidth that we'll go through, the configuration requirements for the accounts. Um, doing all these things in advance will make sure that you have a good experience once Skype Room Systems devices arrive and are deployed. And then we also just covered some of the operational capabilities in terms of how the application gets updated. So some resources. One, uh, at the beginning of today's session, I talked about our goal as an academy team. You can go and view any of the academy trainings that we have out at skypeoperationsframework.com slash academy. You can also use some of the tools that I've talked about in this presentation Links to those tools and documentation is, is documented on this slide. Finally, uh, we are trying to build a community uh, within the Skype for Business uh, community. And so if you go to the link at the bottom, uh, aka.ms slash soft community, uh, that will take you to our community pages. We encourage you to uh, read through those, participate, help others, maybe even answer some of your questions at that community. Also, if you have any feedback, whether it's related to this training, whether it's related to the product, whether it's related to um, something that you think is missing, put that feedback into the community. We have numerous members of the product group um, reviewing that community. We will make sure that that feedback gets sent uh, to the right people. That concludes today's presentation. Thank you very much for your time.